So um, this talk is a combined talk. So in the program, I was meant to be doing the classification of lupus nephritis, strangely, in the infections and genetic kidney disease session. So we've moved it from there, and it's being tagged on to my evidence-based classification of glomerular diseases, which is where it belongs. So this is going to be a double talk. So um, just to manage expectations, when you think, oh, he's going on a bit, you know, it's half an hour now, you've still got time to go. Uh, pathologists love classifying uh, renal disease, and every year in the journals you will read about a new classification. And I, I've got to say, it's rather a sorry story, um, the classification of kidney disease. I, in fact, I would say it's a story of the good the bad and the ugly, uh, and frankly, very, very silly in some cases. Uh, most classifications I don't use myself because they haven't been developed in an evidence-based way, and uh, evidence collected later frequently doesn't support them. So, from your perspective, uh, what you'll be asking, what classifications do I want my pathologists to use? And maybe at the end of this talk, you'll be thinking, are my pathologists using the published guidance correctly? Do I really trust them to classify these renal biopsies accurately? Uh, when you've got their report, you're going to be wanting to know how I should use the information, and particularly, what does this classification mean for my patient? If you remember this half of this one slide, um, you've probably learned the central message of my talk. Whatever classification is being used by your pathologist, consistently the best predictor of renal survival in the biopsy is the extent of chronic damage. Percentage global glomerulosclerosis and even more so, the percentage of the cortex showing interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. It's not surprising because this reflects the stage of disease at the time of presentation and biopsy. So whatever the disease, if you biopsy your patient late, you will see a lot of chronic damage and they will have a short time to end stage disease. For inflammatory glomerular disease where the classifications are most important, in general, it's the inflammatory activity that predicts rate of progression and response to active immunosuppressive therapy. And for you nephrologists, I'm sure you'd agree, that is the information that you're looking for from the biopsy and the classification. Now, when you pick up your journals when you get home and read yet another histological classification of glomerular disease, I want you to be able to look at it with some skepticism and analyze uh, the classification uh, in an evidence-based way. First of all, you're going to be wanting to know what, why have this histological classification been developed? What's it for? Well, one important function is uh, to facilitate clinical trials, to define entry and ex exclusion criteria for the trials and provide hard endpoints where clinical endpoints are impractical. Uh, the BAMF uh, 2017 report actually included a table for the recommendations on best practice for pathology in clinical trials. And I'd agree with many of the items. Uh, an important one that they identified was that the information provided in the report should be as detailed and granular as possi possible. But nowhere in their table uh, did they suggest that it should be developed using an evidence-based system. Classification is also important in the care of your patients, assisting in prognostication and guiding therapeutic decisions, and to achieve consistent patient management between units. There are many classifications, and very detailed and complex classifications, that within each class, the lesions incorporate, the classes are defined by both active and chronic lesions. So you might see within a class, cellular and fibrous crescents put it into this class. Those classifications are in general going to be useless for 
guiding therapy because they're incorporating irreversible chronic damage and active potentially treatable lesions all in the same classes. When a classification is developed, it's important to consider the cohort on which the evidence has been based and then how the pathology data is collected. And it, all of the sources of bias should be uh, identified before identifying the co cohort, including uh, bias in reporting practices. So it's the design of the study that led to the classification which is critically important. Essential in a histological classification is how reproducible is it? In, in other words, does one pathologist use the classification in exactly the same way as another? So if they're given the same biopsy, will they come up with the same conclusion? Reproducibility de depends on very precise and unambiguous definitions, ideally illustrated and consistent methodology. The real difficult issue for pathologists is when the lesions that are incorporated in a classification are identified in different stained sections. How do you incorporate information from an H&E, a PAS, and a silver all in one reproducible classification? And that is a challenge that pathologists are still uh, grappling with at the moment. Uh, we can't say to pathologists, just look at one slide, and that will give you the information that you need to classify that biopsy. They have to look at multiple slides and multiple stains. In terms of the patient cohort, uh, clearly the cohorts have got to be large enough and sufficiently powered to provide the evidence on which to base a classification with sufficient numbers of patients reaching an endpoint. And the inclusion and exclusion criteria will have a major impact on the final conclusions of the classification. And what I'm going to do now is take you through the development of a truly evidence-based classification. There is only one evidence-based classification in glomerular disease at the moment, and that's IgA nephropathy. I know you don't hardly ever see that condition here. That doesn't matter, because I don't want to tell you about IgA nephropathy. I want to discuss the way in which we developed the classification because it applies to any other renal disease. In our cohort on which we based the Oxford classification, we wanted to enrich the cohort for patients who were going to reach the end point, uh, so progress to uh, end stage disease. Therefore, we set a minimum proteinuria of half a gram and we wanted to exclude those already approaching end-stage disease, so we said EGFR over 30. But what that meant was that our classification at the end of the day couldn't be extrapolated to patients at the bad end of the disease spectrum and the good end. So we had to do additional validation in other patients' cohorts before we could make any conclusion regarding the value of the classification in these patients. Then we have to decide on what the endpoint is going to be. I've already told you that renal survival, uh, I think, is the least interesting endpoint because it reflects the stage of disease at the time of presentation and biopsy. More interesting for the nephrologists and for management is the rate of renal functional loss which is why we incorporated both of these endpoints in our original Oxford classification study. However, if we then look at the next 22 validation studies that were published after the initial Oxford classification, only a small minority of them included rate of loss of renal function as an endpoint. And it wasn't surprising that when we did a meta-analysis of the um, uh, results of these studies, it was the T-score, the 
tubular atrophy interstitial fibrosis score that consistently predicted the endpoint because they weren't looking at the right endpoints. Those few studies that looked at rate of loss of renal function found that the active, proliferative, and inflammatory lesions were the strongest predictors of that outcome. All inflammatory renal disease, certainly, is affected by treatment bias, and particularly for, things, uh, for conditions like lupus, IgA nephropathy. Again, um, there was major bias in the validation studies of IgA nephropathy, with a, a median of almost 40% of patients receiving steroids or cytotoxics. The majority of studies found an interaction be between therapy and uh, endocapillary hypercellularity, in other words, inflammation in the glomeruli and crescents. There were only two of the 22 studies that had no treatment bias in that none of the patients received steroids or immunosuppressive therapy, and those showed endocapillary hypercellularity to be the most powerful predictor of renal functional loss. The other important message to remember is that if you, your biopsy shows active inflammatory lesions, and though that patient is giving steroids, that active inflammatory lesion will cease to be a prognostic factor because you've treated it. And this was the data from the Valiga study that showed that in patients with any Im immunosuppression, pathology didn't add clinical value in terms of prognosis to the clinical variables, EGFR at presentation, proteinuria. But those patients not receiving uh, steroid therapy, it did give added value. Uh, the point I'd like to make here is that if you're going to produce a truly evidence-based classification, it's a lot of work and it takes a long time. So it was five years between starting the process for IgA nephropathy and actually publishing the classification. We put a huge amount of effort into trying and getting things right from the start. So in our initial meeting in 2005, I got 20 of the most experienced nephropathologists I could into a room together, gave them a microscope each, and got them to go through the same slides and agree, well, initially disagree and argue uh, violently, and finally agree on the definitions that you can't read because there's so many of them and they're all in small print. But that wasn't good enough. We thought, okay, now we've agreed on the definitions, let's try and apply them and see if it works. And so we initially then scored the first 40 biopsies and met again the following year in Atlanta to go through discrepancies between pathologists. And believe it or not, pathologists are, are individual uh, characters. And we, what we found was systematic differences between the pathologists in the working group. We had some malignant pathologists, some benign pathologists, and some floating in the middle. Uh, and we had to resolve these differences before we embarked on the main study. When we did, it was uh, over 300 renal biopsies circulated amongst all these pathologists based around the world. And several of the glass slides went around the globe uh, more than once. Uh, and some of them even made it back to Oxford, but many didn't. <laughs> Thankfully, these days we've got digital pathology, so we don't need to circulate glass slides. We collected as detailed a data set as we possibly could, so a massive amount of information based on this score sheet, which has got even more complicated since. And when I put together uh, all of the histology data into one Excel spreadsheet, there were over 30,000 histological data items that we'd managed to collect. The first uh, filter we applied to this histology data was reproducibility. We had put a huge amount of effort into making these lesions reproducible, um, but unfortunately, when we looked at um, the ICC, which is a sort of Kappa score for multiple raters, uh, we found that very often the lesions were poorly reproducible. So I've given it a traffic light system here. Green is good, orange, amber is moderate, and red is poor. So normal glomeruli 
we couldn't decide what a normal glomerulus was in IgA nephropathy. So anything that was red went straight in the bin. Then what was left, we uh, correlated with all of the other histological lesions in the biopsies. Because what we didn't want to do was include two lesions in a classification that give you the same information. Double scoring is incredibly common in histological classifications, and I hate it. I get very uptight when I see it, and I see it all the time. So uh, don't include two lesions that give you a, a, an R score of 0.9 or more. And after this filter, we were left with only six histological lesions that made it through to the next round of correlating with the clinical features at presentation and at outcome. We followed the evidence. We didn't start off with any preconceptions of what we would find. And at the end of the day, what we found was the best way to express the histology data was to come up with a scoring system, not a classification at all, because the evidence base didn't support a classification. I've got to say now, this upset an awful lot of people, including several members of the working group who thought we were going to come up with a lupus-like classification and still preached for many years afterwards that we should have come up with a lupus-like classification. But we didn't because the evidence didn't support it. Okay, the publication was classified, uh, the, the, the classification was published and validated in numerous studies. But if a classification is going to be of value in the future, it has to be a living classification and evolve with the evidence. So in 2016, we looked at all of the evidence and um, produced uh, phase two, Oxford classification mark two. We then looked at uh, several studies, multi-center studies, to ask the question, are we making a difference to clinical practice here? And the best study to look at was the Valiga study, because this included 55 centers from 13 European countries. And all of the biopsies were reported initially by the local pathologists. And what we did was look at what features, clinical or histological, predicted treatment in those patients. What determined which patients the nephrologists would give steroids or cytotoxics to? And in multivariate analysis, we found that all of the Oxford classification criteria were being used to determine patient management which was really reassuring for us. And we felt very pleased with ourselves until we looked at the reproducibility of the individual lesions between the local pathologists and the central review pathologists in Oxford. And what we found out that was the M score in particular had very low reproducibility uh, with a kappa score of 0.28, which wasn't uh, improved any by the GWET agreement coefficient. So very poor correlation between the local pathologist's M score and the central pathologist's M score. In fact, the local pathologists were giving a designation of M1 twice as often as the central pathology review. And when we looked at patient outcome for the central pathology M score, there was a nice separation. M1 did much worse than M0. And the clinical value of M score com was completely lost when we looked at the local pathologist's uh, scoring. And what we realized was that most of the local pathologists around Europe weren't applying the guidance used in our original publication. So now you're thinking, I wonder if my pathologist is following the guidance and doing the classification properly. I dare you to go and ask them when you go home. We also found that E-score had low reproducibility, so this is endocapillary hypercellularity. Again, very poor Kappa score, uh, improved with um, uh, the Greta agreement coefficient. What we have realized since, that endocapillary hypercellularity equates 
to glomerular inflammation. So if you stain your biopsies for macrophages with a CD68, which is an antibody virtually every lab in the world will have, those biopsies showing endocapillary hypercellularity contain a lot of macrophages. And if you correlate the MEST scores with the number of macrophages, we find it, they, the E score is everything to do with macrophages, and the others nothing to do. And with a maximum glomerular macrophage count of six, you very, very accurately separate out E0 from E1. And the good news is that when we've looked at reproducibility of counting macrophages, it's very good indeed with a, a kappa score of o, over 0 0.8. So now we've found a tool that improves reproducibility uh, of this classification system. Right. Um, I'm very briefly in three slides having gone through what I consider to be a very thorough evidence-based approach is to tell you about um, classification of another condition that didn't follow the same approach, and that is of anchor-associated vasculitic glomerulonephritis. There's been a lot of data produced by the UVAS group and other groups over the last 20 years that have demonstrated very clearly that in a vasculitic glomerulonephritis, the best predictors of long-term function are the percentage normal glomeruli and the percentage glomerulosclerosis and interstitial fibrosis tubular atrophy. And the best predictor of improvement of function post-therapy are the active lesions, so percentage crescents, necrosis, and interstitial inflammation. And every pathologist reporting these biopsies should include that data. Unfortunately, um, a few years ago, along came a group and published a classification of anchor-associated glomerulonephritis, where all of the detailed information that should be in the biopsy report was simplified into four categories. So the uh, sclerotic class, where more than 50% glomerulosclerosis, the focal with more than 50% normal, the crescentic with more than 50% crescents, and the mixed class, which was everything else. It's a lumped classification that loses a huge amount of information. When you want to know how to manage your patients with vasculitis, you're going to be putting all of the detailed histological data into your clinical evaluation because it's a risk-benefit analysis of what immunosuppression to give. So you'll be wanting to know what the percentage IFTA is. And if it's 70%, there's probably little to be gained from giving your patient uh, drugs which could kill them with inf secondary infections. All of that information, unfortunately, is lost in this classification. So it leaves me feeling very, very grumpy when I read things like that. Uh, actually, this wasn't a grumpy lizard at all. He was staying at the lodge uh, at the Masai Mara, uh, where we stayed uh, uh, over the weekend, and he was very friendly indeed. Um, right. That's the end of my first talk. I'm now just uh, going to go through the new classification of lupus nephritis. You will recognize common themes to what I've just talked about. So in our patients with lupus, what is the classification for? It's when we've got to the diagnosis of lupus nephritis and excluded other conditions, the histology is there to, assess, uh, to assist in therapeutic decisions. What treatment should I give my patient? Are there reversible lesions that could respond to treatment? We all use a classification of lupus nephritis, but in fact, it's got a long and rather sorry history. The WHO classification is, uh, was around 30 years old when it was uh, revised in 2004. There were multiple versions with no official peer review, lack of precise definitions. It was never validated for reproducibility. There were confusion in classes at one and the distinction of focal and segmental in classes three and four. 
the distinctions between classes and within them were rather arbitrary, um, and there was a great deal of confusion over activity and chronicity. So in 2004, an international working group got together in New York and modified it and came up with the ISN-RPS classification of lupus nephritis, which was a WHO mark 32, or whatever we'd got to by that stage. And the simple uh, version of the ISN-RPS classification was this. So minimal mesangial lupus class one, mesangial proliferative class two, endocapillary proliferative, focal and diffuse, classes three and four, membranous class five, uh, and advanced sclerosis class six. And then class three and four were divided into active, chronic, or both. And also class four was divided into segmental or global, depending on whether the lesions involved more than half of each glomerulus in more than half of the glomeruli. Confused? Yes. Uh, so then studies looked at the reproducibility of this classification and the ICC for both WHO and the ASN RPS was very poor indeed, less than 0.2. So pathologists couldn't apply the classification uh, uniformly. When we looked at the ICC of the individual lesions, it was much better, sort of 0 0.5, 0 0.6 and above. The reason for the poor reproducibility was that several definitions were rather arbitrary, vague and confusing. And the RPS has now got a working group looking at the definitions for lesions in the various uh, glomerular disease studies and classifications. And we're finding that the same lesion has very different definitions in the different studies. So for lupus, for example, it requires, a crescent requires more than 25% of the glomerular circumference to show a crescent before we can call it a crescent. So if this glomerulus was from a patient with lupus nephritis, we couldn't call this a crescent. But if it, the patient had IgA nephropathy, which the cutoff is 10%, we could call it a crescent. I'm undermining all of my colleagues here, aren't I? You will never have faith in a pathologist ever again. Arbitrary definitions are generally not very helpful. And when we looked at the distinction of class 4S segmental and class 4G global, there was no difference in outcome in a meta-analysis of a number of studies. The classification of lupus nephritis is of lupus glomerulonephritis. It ignores the tubulo interstitium, but in fact there are multiple studies that demonstrate that the tubulo interstitial changes are, if anything, more important than the glomerular changes. Uh, so here, this um, study demonstrated that tubular atrophy interstitial fibrosis predicted renal survival, but not the glomerular class. And when the glomerular and tubular interstitial elements of the NIH activity and chronicity index are compared with each other, only the tubular interstitial indices uh, come out as prognostic in multivariate analysis. So we've been classifying lupus for decades based on the glomerular changes when it's the tubular interstitial changes that are more important. Also, vascular lesions in lupus are incredibly common uh, but are not included in the classification. Here we see a study of 341 patients. The vast majority had important vascular lesions, the most important of which you will be familiar with is thrombotic microangiopathy. And that's the survival plot for patients whose biopsy shows TMA. Very important lesion, but not included in the lupus classification. In response to all of these deficiencies, um, three in, it's over three years ago now, how doesn't time fly? A group of us got together in Leiden, uh, hosted by uh, Ingeborg here, sitting, driving the microscope, uh, and we set about revising the lupus classification. And we would do it in two phases. Phase one, to improve the definitions into observer agreement and revise the classification according to current evidence. 
phase two, the really tricky phase, will be to devise a evidence-based multi-center study to completely uh, reconfigure the classification, give it the IgA nephropathy treatment. We've now completed and published the phase one of this, and I'll quickly go through the major changes. First of all, in terms of the definitions, we, def we defined the mesangial hypercellularity, and we brought it in line with the definition of IgA nephropathy. So you need, we've changed it from a minimum of three to a minimum of four mesangial cells per peripheral mesang uh, mesangial segment. It's left to phase two to determine whether the mesangial hypercellularity severity and extent has any impact on outcome or treatment. Endocapillary lesions were discussed at length in the group, and I think we spent over two hours arguing over what the definition of endocapillary hypercellularity should be. We came up with this definition, and even after we agreed in the meeting room, by the time the classification was published, the little bit in red somehow magically disappeared. Uh, the, num the significance of all of these, the number, type of inflammatory cells, uh, the role of macrophages, we're putting that to phase two. So that's yet to be determined. We redefined crescents to bring it in line with other glomerular diseases. So our minimum 25% uh, our, our was reduced to 10% of the glomerular circumference. And we divided crescents into cellular fibrous and fibrocellular according to the quartiles. We recognize that the distinction of 4S and 4G was arbitrary and of no value whatsoever. So this was removed from the classification. The presence of fibrinoid necrosis was not recognized in the ISN-RPS classification because it was combined with cariorexis, which develops in a very different way. Fibrinoid necrosis and endocapillary hypercellularity seem to develop through different mechanisms. Endocapillary hypercellularity correlates with the amount of glomerular deposits. Fibrinoid necrosis, less so, and more closely resembles the vasculitic type lesions you see in porcine immune glomerulonephritis. So we uh, decided to emphasize the importance of fibrinoid necrosis and we changed its definition in the activity and chronicity indices. We recognize that A, active C, chronic, and AC are very crude and of little clinical value. So we've replaced those with, and we now recommend the pathologist produces detailed information on the percentage of all of the active lesions and the extent of chronic damage, not only glomerulosclerosis, but interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy and the vascular lesions. We suggest that um, pathologists could consider using the NIH activity chronicity indices, but when we went back to the paper, uh, which was published back in the early 80s, we realized that the lesions in the index, uh, index weren't classified or defined in any way. So you can see all of these elements of the indices were scored as mild, moderate, and extensive or severe with no attempt to define what's mild or what's moderate or what's severe, which makes it useless for the pathologist because you can't follow it because nothing's been defined. So what we did was actually defined mild, moderate, severe uh, in these indices and we separated fibrinoid necrosis from cariorexis. Which lesions are the most important in guiding therapy will be left to phase two. So I'm almost there. In summary, uh, the current new lupus classification, we've adjusted the definitions to bring them in line with other glomerular diseases. We've removed the S and G and the A and C, and we're now planning a truly evidence-based approach to lupus nephritis classification. But that's where our problems start. All patients with lupus nephritis and all clinical trials are confounded by treatment bias. You, what we can't do now is study the natural history of lupus nephritis.
So it's going to be very difficult to do what we did with IgA nephropathy, where there were many centres still not treating IgA nephropathy actively. So here, here is the brave group that's going to set apart uh, about phase two. But I must say, what I would say is that if I wanted to get there, I wouldn't start from here. And I'm, I might grow very old before this phase is completed. And thank you very much. <laughs>